During the Second World War, Allied bombers really had it tough. Even though most of the time they had escorts to protect themselves from enemy houses, most of these bombers were shot down during their operations and mostly not by the enemies they had in the air, but by those on the ground. Most German anti-aircraft weapons were really sophisticated, much more than you think. The famous Flax 88, or commonly called 88 were really problematic weapons for the Allied bombers and were so effective that the Germans made gigantic towers called Flak Towers, where among many anti-aircraft weapons they of course had the famous Flak 88 to protect the cities. If we look at how it works, we see that the ammunition in most cases explodes very close to or at the exact height where the planes are passing by. How did the anti-aircraft ammunition know exactly where to explode? We're talking about World War II, decades before the digital age. Smart ammunition is only just being developed today. So to answer this curious question, let's talk a little about the anti-aircraft used in World War II, especially those used by the Axis. There were many anti-aircraft guns in the Axis, not just the Flak 88. There were the Flak 105 and also 75mm. In addition, there were low-caliber Flak anti-aircraft guns that were more like machine guns. There were 20 millimeters, and the Japanese also operated machine guns of this type, only 25 millimeters. They were quite common, just like the Flak 88. I'm sure you know their characteristic sound. Well, low caliber anti aircraft guns worked simply by aiming for the projectiles to hit the planes to derive. No more, their ammunition was not much different from conventional ammunition. Their effectiveness depended on the volume of fire they could deliver. The more cadence, the better. That's why we see that most of these weapons have quite a few barrels, but heavy anti-aircraft weapons like the Flags 88 are a bit more complicated. As you know, bombers operated at very high altitudes and the ammunition took several seconds to reach the bomber. For example, the ammunition took a second to reach 300 meters in height, so taking this into account, the projectiles took 26 seconds to reach a bomber that was at 8,000 meters. If you aim an anti-aircraft gun directly at a plane that is flying at 8,000 meters and fire, by the time the projectile reaches the height of the plane, it will have moved from the site quite some time ago, so to operate the flags, it took much more than just firing the weapon a little ahead of the plane as the multi-barrel anti-aircraft gun operators did. Because low-caliber multi-barrel anti-aircraft guns depend on the eye and quick predictions of the men who operated them to decide where and when to fire, they had a fairly limited range. But the flags could attack more than 30,000 feet high, that is, more than 9,000 meters without any kind of problem. How did the gunners predict where the plane would go considering that the plane is more than 9 kilometers high? Well, of course, everything was done by machines and calculation. Everything started with a stereoscopic rangefinder, where one or several operators obtained the direction of the plane to be shot down and off the angular height of it continuously while the bomber was being attacked. This information was sent electrically by cables to a central machine that analogously calculated the correct advance of the plane and, of course, also the time that the projectiles had to have continuously while it was in range. Subsequently, this information was sent to each battery by cables so that they continuously corrected the direction to fire and of course also the time that the projectiles to be fired had to have. The standard German anti-aircraft projectiles used a time delay fuse so that it would explode at the exact height just as the enemy plane passed nearby. This interconnected system allowed for many batteries to be constantly firing at the same site between 4 and 6 of them, allowing for a high rate of fire and having a large burst of projectiles falling on the plane to be shot down. As the bomber delved deeper into enemy territory, it could encounter multiple groups of batteries that, as long as the enemy plane was in range, would be constantly firing at it, making the probability of it returning safely quite low. This entire interconnected system has a name and it's called continuously pointed fire or constant aimed fire. There were even gigantic interconnected systems that had large groups of batteries connected and received data via cables from a master command post that obtained the enemy plane's data from various points and made the prediction of where to shoot and when. This command post could direct the fire of large groups of free lossless audio codecs, so instead of firing continuously, they all fired together at once, then after firing they obtained new data, corrected the direction and fired all together again. The cycles lasted between 30 and 60 seconds and were really effective and as field equipment was not used but a much larger and fixed one. 
The measurements of the master command center were even more accurate. This whole larger and interconnected system was called anticipated concentration. The Allied bombers had many ways to evade all these tactics. For example, what they did was every so often make random variations in their flight so that the probability that the Germans predicted the flight of the plane was considerably reduced. But the Germans also had another technique to counteract this. What the Germans did was aim all the flags in a very approximate area around the possible course of the plane and send a very large volume of fire to this. Normally, this area was placed near the approximate area where the bomber would drop its bombs. While the enemy bomber is inside, evasive actions would increase the probability of being shot down as it would make them spend more time inside the curtain of fire. If this was done well in advance, the enemy plane of course could simply dodge the curtain so it had to be done very close to the plane. This technique was not as precise as the previous ones, but it was a very good last resort to manage to shoot down the enemy plane. Something very important that we must consider about the flags is that they lost effectiveness with altitude. That's why bombing missions were done at the highest possible altitude to reduce unnecessary losses. Also, of course, the flags had a limited range. That's why we had flags of various calibers, 88mm medium range and 105mm of a superior range. The Germans also tried to use much more modern projectiles than the ones we saw in this video. For example, they tried to use a magnetic projectile that exploded upon detecting metals in the air or they also tried to use an acoustic one that upon hearing noises similar to those of airplanes exploded but simply these projectiles were too expensive and difficult to produce in addition to not being as reliable as the projectiles that based their operation on time in the end these were the most used and were used throughout the conflict as they did not cause too many problems as you can see, more of the flags were really impressive weapons and were not just simple cannons. They were used in many areas in the conflict, in tanks, as anti-tank cannons, as artillery and anti-aircraft artillery, as we have already seen. I hope that now you have an even broader view of this majestic weapon that definitely changed history. 